welcome the Saint David. As we gather to worship, we welcome those who are, of course, in person and those who are watching online or will be watching online later with a taped version. Uh, those in the hallway, eventually make your way in here. We love to have you in here joining us. <laughs> but uh, we begin the Lenten season. Uh, this is the first Sunday of Lent, and you may say, what is Lent? If you hang with the sermon later on, we'll explain what Lent is and what is involved in Lent in a, as a church and as individuals. Uh, a few announcements from your bulletin, uh, just some reminders of past things that we've been uh, reminding you of. Church directory. Church directory, uh, there's some new developments with that, good things, uh, because we've been having such a good sign-up of uh, uh, those that are going to be participating, we had to extend another day of uh, portrait taking. So we've added Saturday, March 26th. You can read about those details there. Also, now we're giving you some more details about how you can make the purchases of your portfolio uh, pictures, if you like. And uh, see the ladies there out there on the table and Michelle Zimmerman, they'll give you more information. Uh, probably around 4 o'clock yesterday, you got a, a spam call or a robo call from a guy from this church. I didn't know it was going to happen again uh, until I went to bed. I was at about 8.30. Huh, I got this message from somebody that spam. And I looked, and it was myself calling. <laughs> now, some of you might have got actually two calls. If we have your landline number still that is effective and your cell phone, Dean Baldwin and I know Denise Desitel, they both got two calls uh, within probably a period of close to each other. So what is that? It's just a reminder if you haven't done so already, and that's what the recording says, is to sign up for the uh, pictorial directory. If you call St. David's home, we'd love to have you join us in that. Uh, uh, the pictorial directory. We've been inviting you to join us in taking a tour of the Cadalasso Family Health Center in York, and Dr. Dennis Delp is organizing that with us. He's our mediator between the Cadalasso and us in organizing a date and time. But many of you, several of you, have said, I'd like to go, but you never really officially called the office, let us know. You can do it by just leaving a voicemail. I'd say if you want to really go on that trip, write it on a piece of note. Take a piece of the bulletin and write your name and that you want to go to Cotalasso and give it to me after the service because we want to begin uh, to start that schedule of that visit there. And we'd love to have you join us at this ministry that's really making an impact on lives in York. We all have been praying for the uh, war in Ukraine, and uh, we have an announcement there in the bulletin uh, that our missionary Ken Sears, who serves with European Christian Mission on behalf of the EC Church, uh, Ken has given us information about the mission organization he serves and how they've created a refugee assistance fund, a care fund, and it explains how you can contribute to that. It's a very good missions organization. Uh, we've had, the EC Church has had a relationship with them for many years. Ken has served over 25 years with European Christian Mission. So that's one avenue you may be able to help. I know Samaritan's Purse has emergency hospitals going to countries around the Ukraine, and that would be another organization. Uh, the Adult Missionary Fellowship of St. David's met on Wednesday, and they decided to give $600 to European Christian Missions Crisis Fund for the Ukraine. So uh, as we go on in weeks to come, we're going to also be able to extend you an invitation to help those Christians and, and non-believers in uh, the Ukraine and the countries around them. So be in prayer, prayerfully consider how you may be able to provide provision for uh, those that are in need. There's more announcements. I'm going to ask you just read your bulletins, act upon them, mark your calendars, commit yourself in time and prayer to the, the work of the body of Christ called St. David's. A note for you. Thanks to everyone that helped last Saturday to drop and clean up the trees. It was wonderful to have so much help. 
Thanks for Bobby Joe for the donuts and coffee. As soon as I know when we will be dropping the last tree, I will let you know, Brad Schof. And there's been discussion maybe in two Saturdays from now that will happen, but Brad will be letting us know more. And again, thank you for your help. You always rise to help and serve when needed. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all of our announcements for this morning. Our focus, of course, is to come and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus. Will you join us? Stand up, give everybody a big smile, a wave as the praise team comes to lead us. Good morning. The praise team would like to welcome you this morning. I hope you'll join us in song as we worship. Um, I don't know if you read the um, scripture on the front of your bulletin this morning, but I think it's a good lead into our first song. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And our first song this morning is, My Life is in You, Lord. to you this morning. I'm thinking probably many of you know it. Um, Wendy, in our practice, uh, our last practice, said she calls this the pandemic song. And then I found this um, while I was doing some research. It says, since the COVID-19 pandemic started in the spring of 2020, Waymaker has been shown and played in hospitals, parks, and many other public areas, often with large groups of people singing the song together to spread hope and encouragement to others. So on that note, um, just a couple things before we start. If you don't know this song, please watch the screen. If you do know this song, please watch the screen. <laughs> we have um, sort of made our own arrangement of it, um, and you may or may not notice. We just cut out a lot of um, repeats, but hopefully we'll all end at the same place. So here we go with Waymaker. Thank you. 
Were the slides okay? Because I was worried. <laughs> okay, good. In Isaiah 43, 2, we read, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be church family let's pray together this morning oh god our way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness thank you for making a way for each and every one of us thank you for making a path that each one of us should follow thank you for loving us every day of our lives and may it be our desire to love you and to serve you more in jesus name Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Psalm 91. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. 
His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up with their hands, in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is God's word. As we continue our worship this morning, please open your hymnals to hymn number 435. What a friend we have in Jesus. Children are dismissed to junior churches as well. read Psalm 91, I want to remind you of verse 15. Verse 15 says, He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And in the hymn we sang multiple times, it said, Take it to the Lord in prayer. So 
Let us take it to the Lord in prayer right now and bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we've seen the headlines. We've heard it in the news. Lord, we've heard about the cries for help, the needs of the people in Ukraine, the needs of the people in Poland, Romania, and the areas that are taking in the refugees, the thousands of refugees that are leaving Ukraine. Lord, we've heard of the stories of the many men that were Ukrainian born who are going back to their country to fight. God, we've heard of the help that's been provided, the billions and millions of dollars that have been given, the military aid that's been given, but God, what we can give is spiritual ministry, the prayer, the call, the ask for your help. Lord, we we have yet to hear the ministry that's being done. Lord, but as I've seen it in the news, there are churches in Ukraine that are in the streets praying. In the cold, in the snow, Lord, and I can't imagine that happening here in America, people going out into the snow and in the cold to pray and to cry out. But God, the Ukrainians, they're not laying down they're standing up. And God, as it affects the entire world, may you protect us, Lord. May you help us. Lord, we always look at the gas prices and say, wow, it's $4.30, but God, we aren't thinking right now as to the fact that millions of refugees are leaving their homes. Their country is being destroyed and When they go back to where their home was, Lord, it may not be there. And they may lose everything that they ever had. The pictures of their children growing up. And God, may you shelter them. Lord, as Israel has an iron dome, may you place that around Ukraine. That they would continue to push back against what is occurring. And Lord, that the world would stand up and provide assistance. And God, that you would protect us all in this time of need. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, We take your Bibles and turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, is where we'll be today. Part of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, while you're doing that, and also uh, waiting for the screen to come up, Uh, Many of you have asked, and I know you're praying for my nephew, Corey, and uh, some I've been able to give updates, but uh, let me give you an update. And um, he was in the hospital, went back to the hospital this week uh, because of an infection in his body somewhere and uh, high fever, and they addressed that with antibiotics and of course, they use uh, IV antibiotics, and somehow the IV that they inserted caused him extreme pain for several days. We just don't know. I haven't heard the medical explanation what was going on there. Uh, they were able to address the pain with some pain meds, and that subsided. The fever went away, uh, and he's back at the rehab. Uh, he probably has a few more weeks there. Um, Corey has no insurance, so uh, he'll probably have to enter into some kind of state or federal program of care for that. Uh, That's still to be worked out, I guess, and uh, I don't get updates on that. I get updates really on his condition, and uh, he's uh, learning uh, how to take care of himself. He's paralyzed still from uh, the chest down. Uh, He moves his arms. They're strengthening his arms so he can move himself in wheelchair. He's maneuvering that. He's still on a a ventilator. That's been decreasing, and they're hoping again as his lungs, body goes stronger, uh, that'll be able to be subsided and taken off. And um, so a lot's going on. Uh, We're praying for his soul, really. Um, He was in a stage of being a prodigal. Uh, spiritually. Uh, He has confessed Christ as his Lord and Savior, but 
um, living as a prodigal, and uh, that's been our prayer. And we've seen God working there spiritually too, the reports I'm getting. So praise the Lord for that. We're praying for that miracle uh, that he would be able to walk again and function like that again. Uh, but only the Lord knows. But we do appreciate your prayers and concerns. So uh, we begin a new series today in the month of March uh, called Lent. A time for renewal, prayer, fast, give, witness. And we're going to do this for the month of March. Uh, on Wednesday uh, was the official start of Lent called Ash Wednesday. Now this may be all new, confusing to you. I'm going to give a little bit of a quick lesson about what Lent is in, in the beginning of the message. So what is Lent? Uh, this Lent was established as a time of spiritual reflection and commitment to Christ centuries ago. Centuries ago. And what it was early on is when you became a, a new convert, um, there was 40 days and 40 nights. Got that? Hmm. Who experienced 40 days and 40 nights? Jesus, okay? So they're patterning it after Jesus, this 40 days. Actually, Lent is 46 days, if you are a literal person. It's 46 days, but we don't count the Sundays. There's six Sundays in Lent leading up to Easter. So 40 days, and the church would emphasize 40 days and 40 nights for new converts, new believers. And it was a kind of a time of reflection. There was time of discipleship. A lot of times the catechism, the teachings of the church, doctrine and theology, practices of the church would be taught to these new converts. And at the end of 40 days, they were asked, do you follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And then on Easter Eve, uh, before sunrise, they would be baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ. A very serious time, you know that? And I think we, we can near learn from the church long ago about that. How serious are we about Christ? You, you made a decision to follow Christ. We're going to disciple you to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then your public proclamation of your faith in Jesus Christ and testify to the new life, the grace of Jesus is in your baptism. Wonderful time. Wonderful time to think of that. Now, as time changed and as different breaks in the church developed in theology, practice, um, and even in ethnic emphasis and all that and tradition, a lot of changes have taken place. Now, you'll find still there are churches that practice a really strict liturgical emphasis in Lent on Wednesday, some churches, and even actually it's becoming more of a practice in churches, not just Catholic churches or uh, Anglican churches, but even, uh, we would say, conservative, evangelical, Protestant churches practice Ash Wednesday. And that's a time of uh, contrition, uh, repentance, uh, acknowledging our fragile who we are as human beings, that one day we're going to turn back to ashes. But there's a lot of other things about remorse and the using of the symbol of the ashes on the forehead. Maybe you've come from a church tradition like that. I think there's some very important things in the symbolism of that and from uh, the reliance on, again, coming back to Scripture there. But it's changed, Lent has changed, and again, there's a 40 days emphasis, and uh, we try to do that at St. David's, but not a real strict adherence to a liturgical there. We tell you it's the first Sunday of Lent, and we're in the Lenten season. But again, I want to help you also see what many see is a time of renewal. Uh, Lent is a season of renewal for 40 days. Now, we should always have this emphasis, but sometimes we have to be intentional. We have to be an intentional in how we follow Christ. Uh, is my heart totally to Christ? Is my commitment totally to Christ? Most likely not, because we are still in the flesh. We still wrestle with that nature of the flesh. But again, that's an excuse, not a reason. 
okay, the, that we need to be really following Christ. And Easter Lent helps us do that. So in the season that we're going to be in for this month of March, Lent will still go on into April, and we'll have more of an emphasis that. And that emphasis in April will be more like what happened in Jerusalem. We're going to kind of probably be calling a journey to Jerusalem. Uh, I haven't decided fully on that, but that's where I find the Lord leading me. And I asked you last Sunday, please pray on how I'm to bring the messages for Lent. And this is what happened this week as your prayers. Thank you for your prayers. So we're going to look at four things in Lent, an emphasis for renewal of our commitment to Christ. Pray, fast, give, and witness. Each Sunday we're going to look at one of them. And so this Sunday we look at when you pray is the title of the message. So we're in asking to be at Matthew 6, 5 through 13. Matthew 6, 5 through 13. Uh, the traditions in Lent have always kind of, since the, centuries ago, they would call them the three pillars of Lent. Prayer, fasting, and using an old term called almsgiving, or we'll just strictly going to call it giving. Maybe, again, you came from a church tradition background that had this emphasis there. And, but I am adding the fourth as a, and that the, we have been called as a witness. And again, as we're going to have a renewed life in Christ, as we think in Lent and commit to, how are we witnessing for him in this world today? So that's where I want to go with those four emphases there in Lent today here at St. David's. But we're starting first with the idea of prayer, of prayer. And so if you're with me, uh, we're going to go to Matthew 6, 5 through 13. And uh, we have the first part of that there, starting at verse 5. And uh, Jesus mentions this several times, this phrase, as he teaches. And this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, when you pray. So there's the assumption we're to be praying people as followers of Jesus. And I know as I encounter people, and even myself, prayer can be one of the hardest things to do. Uh, and uh, But I learned years ago, if it's hard to pray, what you need to do? You need to pray harder. It's hard to pray, you need to pray harder. Okay, And uh, hopefully that's what the challenge will be, is that you need to pray harder. And, and with the right heart is what Jesus is going to teach us here. So he says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. And I think we all know what a hypocrite is. We've seen them. We've been one. Anybody want to confess to that today? Sure, we've been there. Even your pastor. Can I tell you? I mean, Sundays I get before you, and there's other times I get before you in teaching and study and present there, and then I'm challenged myself, and I should be. Am I living that, or do I, am I giving lip service to it? And, you know, we're to, we know we're to pray, but are we giving lip service to praying? Oh, I'll pray for you. When somebody tells you that, here's the challenge back at them. Can we pray right now, say to them? Let's see how serious they are. And if the pastor says, I'll pray for you, you say, can we pray now, pastor? And I always try to do an intentional prayer right there when I say, and, I, and somebody gives a request or something. I want to pray right then and there so I don't forget. But we need to be praying people and not to be hypocritical. And here's how... Jesus attacks and shows the hypocrites their behavior, and he's speaking to you and I. For they, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. See, devout Jews prayed three times a day. And I'm not sure about the modern practice of devout Jews, but devoted Jews at Jesus' time, they would pray three times. Now, who do you know in the Old Testament that did that? They probably took a pattern from him, but it's also kind of traditionally uh, uh, inherited down through. Daniel. Daniel prayed three times, right? He'd open his windows and looking towards Jerusalem, right? And uh, so these, he's, you know, he's commending that they are praying, 
You know, he's not saying they shouldn't pray. He says they love to pray. That may be different from you and I. Again, you may struggle. What do I say? What do I do? Uh, do I listen? Yes, you do all that. You, you know, lay your heart out there, speak, and you listen. Uh, but uh, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue, so in the place of worship, and on the street corners. So in a sense, Jesus acknowledges that prayer doesn't just happen in a sanctuary here. Uh, but also out at home or out there in public. So there's that sacred, secular emphasis here. These people are loving. They, they're standing in the synagogues and praying, and they're on the street corners. But what's wrong? What's he pointing out that is wrong? Anybody want to help me? They want to be seen by men. They want to be seen by men. They have this, Jesus is pointing out that they have this outward piety. But they have this really inward pride that's motivating them to pray. They're, they want to be seen. They want to be seen in how, they, they, they're, how righteous, holy they are for God. Now that's, again, that's the wrong attitude, right? Wrong motivation. I had a pastor growing up, and he told this illustration. It just impacted me because he, he talked about his college that he went to. Then actually I followed and went to the same college. And next door to the college is a diner called the Golden Gate Diner. And they had a wonderful, beautiful waitress that worked there once, my wife. And, uh, uh, and it was just next door to the college. She could work there. And even after we married and moved back into the Lehigh Valley, she went back there to work for them because they really treated her really well. A Greek family. They still own it. And, uh, uh, but he tells the story, my pastor, uh, some of you know, Gordy Lewis, was you maybe some of your, was your pastor at one time. And Gordy says that when he was in college, the guys would go next door to the diner. What a great place to put a diner, next to a college. You know, open 24 hours a day. And, uh, but he said, we'd fill a booth, two, I mean, four of them, six of them, fill a booth, not a big diner, and uh, you could hear anything probably that's all going on. It's noisy in there. And they would go, and of course, before they had their meal, they would pray. And he said there was one guy, he just hoped that he didn't volunteer to pray. Now, that sounds really bad. I know that. But what happened next was, this, if this guy volunteered to pray, he'd sc scoot out from the, the uh, booth, get down on a knee in the aisle of the main aisle of the the diner, raise his hand and boldly pray. Now, I don't know his heart. Gordy didn't know his heart. But I know Gordy used that as an illustration of, again, is this right, you know? Maybe he was. Maybe he had a, his heart was so legitimate. But it's like every time that when they went out, that was his way. And it was like all eyes of the diner were there. Maybe it was a witness. I don't know. And maybe I'm even wrong for bringing this illustration up, but to me it sounds like the man wanted the attention. He wanted the attention. Perhaps it was a witness. But again, when you pray publicly, here, maybe in another setting that you're asked to pray or you offer to pray, what is the motive of your prayer? What is it, to impress other people of your spirituality? Or is it really your sincerity that you want to pray to God on behalf of those that are with you? And you're praying with them. You're just leading out loud. Okay? We do this almost monthly. We invite you to praise and prayer and, and times and lead out in prayer. It's to have you lead us from your heart before the throne of God in humbleness, praying with us and for us before our Lord. And I can say, I don't see anybody proud and doing that. Some, you may have your grammar right and you're using the right biblical terms or not. Or, you know, just be yourself. Can I give you that advice? 
many asked, you know, about prayer and, and talking as a pastor to me. And I said, it's simply a conversation you're having with God. You don't always get your words right when you're talking to somebody else. You know, I'm the biggest butcher of the English language on a Sunday morning. Uh, I hope I've gotten better in my 20 years here, but it's just the fact is we stumble on our words. And sometimes you may say, I stumble across my words with God, or I just don't know how to say it. Friends, just let your personality, who God made you, who wired you to let you pray. You don't have to have all the theological terminology and sanctification and righteousness and all that. You can use those terms, know those terms, but don't use them to impress people. It's just you having a conversation with God. Okay? So may, again, that be the start there. When Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They want to be noted. They want to be seen. And what does Jesus say about the reward for this kind of thing? They don't get a reward from him, right? He says, they have received the reward in full. They got their recognition. They got puffed up. They got people to see and people to talk maybe about how wonderful that prayer was. But Jesus says, they got the reward. Now, Jesus doesn't say, was our prayer answered? Or did he some way bring discipline and judgment on them? Maybe we read the, between the lines. I don't know. But he just says, they got the reward. They were looking for a blessing. Their blessing was they blessed themselves by that arrogance and pride in looking for people and what they think. Let's go on. Verse 6. Again, Jesus says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So he went from a public setting of being in the synagogue, on the street corners, and there's nothing, real, nothing wrong with that. Again, it depends on what's our motive, what's our heart condition there. Uh, why are we doing that in public? But Jesus says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We all need that secret place that we know that we feel that we can go to God. It's very comfortable for us. Maybe it's kneeling at your bedside in your bedroom. Maybe it's out in nature on a walk, but you, you just have that place you have there. And interesting, the word that's used here for room is not just a simple word in the, in the language here. It means treasure room, treasure room. And then some have expounded on this and uh, saying that the word used is kind of also descriptive of the treasure room in the temple that the people worshiped at that this is a very special place. It's a rich place. So again, when you meet with God the Father to pray, it should be enriching. It should be blessed there. Uh, and he's not seen, but you know he's there. John Stott, he was a British pastor and theologian, had a heavy influence on Christianity in the 20th, century and still continues on in the 21st century even though he's gone with the Lord he said this about prayer the essence of prayer is to seek God so you want to know what's the purpose of prayer it's to seek God to seek him his will to be done his direction his wisdom his strength his guidance you're seeking him Psalm 27, 8 says, My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Is that what your intent is when you pray? When you go to that secret place, that private place, that rich place, that you and God are alone, and you can just lay your heart out before him. Is that what happens? You're seeking God. 1 Chronicles 28.9, 1 Chronicles 28.9 records a portion of the conversation 
that King David had with his son Solomon, who would eventually follow him as king. And this is David's advice to Solomon. 1 Chronicles 28, 9. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. If you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So David's advice, Solomon, seek God and he'll be found by you. And we have words from Jeremiah where God says, you will seek me, you will find me. You seek me with all your heart, you will find me. That should be the intent of our prayer. Am I seeking God? God? And we speak a lot in our prayer, and we should. But there's times we know that I don't know how to pray. You may be in so much anguish and sorrow, or you're in such a situation, you're so perplexed. What do I do? You know what? You, I would suggest sit and be quiet. And just listen. Just listen. And, uh, and let them speak. Maybe you need to put some music on, Christ-centered music, God-centered music, that just would speak to you. I mean, I'm sure many of you can testify when you turn on Christian radio and a song comes up and it hits you, and it's like, thank you, God. Thank you, God, I needed that. We just sang Waymaker. I've been waiting for the praise team. They've been working on it for several weeks there. And it's like, is this a Waymaker Sunday? They said, yes, okay? So, I mean, Waymaker can speak to you, a song like that. And a lot of people are being spoken to by music like that. Again, uh, stop and listen, converse with God. And again, it, this, the essence of prayer is to seek God. Does your, rep your prayers reflect that? Verse 7. Third time, Jesus says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. Now, he went from the hypocrites, now he's going to the pagans, okay? The, mainly the, in the Gentile world, those with various religions. And he says, uh, don't be like them. They just keep babbling on in prayer. And um, there's forms of prayer in uh, religions, and we'll call them false religions because there are only one true religion, one true faith, and that's in Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, we did get a little amen there. And, uh, but those that are not uh, practice, I mean, those that are practicing these false religions, uh, there are some of their practices is they will just keep repeating the same words over and over and almost bring them into a canatonic state and, uh, and that uh, and some weird things begin to develop and manifest there, not spiritually, but, but because of what's going on and possibly demonic forces, satanic forces there. And, but it's just a repetitiveness to there, like almost a mantra. And again, we're, Jesus said, keep away from that. You know, you know, and he says, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now, God wants you to pour out your heart and talk to Him. Okay? Some of us are talkers, and some of us are minor talkers, and that, that we don't, not as wordy. And that's okay. That's okay. That's who God made you. Okay, because again, I invite you when we pray here, and invite you to pray aloud and lead us. If you're a person as a talker, go ahead and talk to God on our behalf like who you are. If you're a simple person that says, I'm, I'm not many words, that's okay too. We're not judging. We are just happy that you're leading us and feel privileged to hear your prayer. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. A request becomes vain reputation if it only is babbling words without a sincere heart that desires to seek and do God's will. 
Got that quote from Warren Wiersbe, again, pastor and author, Bible commentator. Let me repeat it. A request becomes vain reputation if it is only a babbling words without a sincere heart that desires to seek and do God's will. You know, I don't know if this happens. You know, is God there hearing my prayer and I'm going on and on and on and I'm repeating myself and it's like, is God saying, come on, Pat, I know it. I know what you need. And the scripture told, we know, he knows what we're going to say before we say it. So why pray is the obvious question. We're to seek him. Remember, I told you the essence of prayer is seeking God and that we're humbly coming before him. And he knows what we need, but a lot of times he waits for you to ask. He waits for you to ask. And he either says yes, what, no, or maybe, or wait. But we're to continue. And there's nothing wrong with having the same prayer request every day and, and because it's on your heart. You're agonizing through the situation. You're maybe praying for someone that's really in a bad situation. Maybe you are too. But again, it, he, it, may, it may be saying to you, no, I want you to go this way. You think you should go this way. no. This way, I'll say yes there. Or I want you to wait. You're not ready for it. You're not ready for it. So again, is our prayers like vain reputation and really not sincere? We're just kind of pushing, pressuring God and he's saying, you got to wait. You got to wait or no, you're not getting what you want. And here's, sometimes he'll eventually show you why. Or maybe... Not until I get to heaven, I'm going to get the why. And by then, it's not going to even matter, right? With this teaching now of Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, as I read this, I think of one of the favorite Proverbs of Jesus. And if you want to turn in your Bible, I'm going to read it. It's not going to be on the screen. But Luke 18, 9 through 14, Jesus told a parable of a Pharisee and tax collector. And I think it goes right along with he, what he taught here about hypocrites. And we're really all hypocrites at times. Nobody's perfect in their walk. So Luke 18, 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and said, My God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What we're challenged by Jesus in this parable is, which one are we? The tax collector or the Pharisee? What does your prayers reflect? And if we can reflect upon what we've seen already in Matthew 6 here from Jesus, let me give you some questions and they're not on the screen or they're not on your outline. You may want to jot them down if you care. Question one, when you pray in a public, in public, what is your motive? When others are around and they hear your prayer, what is your motive? Do you pray out of a humble heart before God? Or do you want to see other people react to who you appear to be? Are you concerned more about what God sees or what man sees when you pray? I just, it just came to my mind as I was saying that, you know, we, we have the holiday meals. Easter's coming. 
and you go to visit somebody, and uh, there's believers there, maybe just sprinkled among the family gathering or friends, and there's unbelievers there. And the tendency is, well, ask the most spiritual person in the group to pray. Maybe we ought to start saying, you know, anybody want to pray besides Uncle Joe? We've heard his prayers for years. Nobody's going to say that, okay? Just, you know, but if it's somebody's coming to your house, then maybe say, hey, how about you doing the prayer, the blessing this, week, this time? Just a thought that came to me as we were going through this. But again, you know, it's good to hear other people pray. It's okay to hear Uncle Joe, too. And uh, you may have to say, sorry, Uncle Joe, I asked so-and-so to pray this year. Is that okay? I hope it is okay. It's your house, right? You can pick who you pray. But again, what is the intent of the prayer? Seeking God, not seeking to be recognized, congratulated. That was a moving prayer. Prayers can be moving. That's okay. You, you can compliment somebody on the prayer year because you can be in agreement with that prayer and endorse that prayer and say, yes, that, that lifted my faith in, in that prayer. Hearing kids pray, that'll humble you. That'll humble you. And I told you last week, you know, come to Awana. Watch the kids pray. Okay? Let's move on. Verse 9, coming to a very familiar passage now to you. This then is how you should pray. So he says, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, and he gives the clarification, he challenges, asks you to correct things. And then he says, now, here's how you pray. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one, excuse me, it says. Now, look at that on the screen. Look at it in your Bibles. There's something to observe there that you might have missed, and you may have been praying this prayer for years. There's no personal pronouns used in the prayer. I see our, uh, us, another us, another us, we. It's not a personal prayer. It's kind of like a collective prayer. And we use it in worship here at times, the Lord's Prayer. Together we pray it. But, you know, Jesus says, when you pray, he's been saying, and now he says, when you guys pray, here's a prayer I want you to, to pray and how you should pray. Uh, and it's collectively. See, we're in the family of God. We're brother and sister. We're part of the body of Christ. One's a hand, one's an ear, one's an eye, one's a leg, and so forth. We all have a part. We're a connection together. So it says, and this is not just for Pat to pray, but all of us together to pray. Now, it's okay to pray it alone. Sometimes, again, when you don't know what to pray, it's good to go back to the Lord's Prayer and let it be your prayer. But you don't want to make it as the babbling pagans that just you use it and it's hollow of any kind of meaning so something that becomes very familiar to us can be just come hollow and empty of significance so i and when you get into that secret place with god and you don't know what to pray and you pull out the lord's prayer and i don't want to say that flippantly but you use the lord's prayer be intentional break it down as you pray and and take heart in each phrase that is offered there. So it's a pattern, I would call it a pattern of prayer. He says, this is how you should pray. Now, it can be what you pray, but this is how you pray. Okay, I, I take it as a pattern of prayer. 
And again, I, I don't want to spend a lot in it there. I mean, because it could be a whole series ahead for us on the Lord's Prayer. But our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, your place is in heaven and you are holy. You're proclaiming that. And that is an act of worship. An act of worship. What is the chief purpose of man? Is to glorify God is to bring worship and honor and praise to God. Does your prayer do that? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here we're saying, I'm setting aside my agenda. I want to consecrate myself. I want to consecrate my agenda to your agenda. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not Pat's kingdom, not my will to be done, Lord, but your will. As your will is carried out in heaven, may it be done here on earth. We're committing ourselves, our time, talent, treasures, everything about life we want to concentrate, consecrate to God. Does your prayers reflect that? Give us today our daily bread. Provision. You know, I think you already know, it's not just talking about bread. Okay, but it, it says daily, so your daily need. What did Jesus teach about worry? Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble. We have enough trouble here. Don't worry about tomorrow. So, I mean, you can pray, pray for provision tomorrow. The Lord will set that prayer. But how about right now? You know, that meal that's before you soon after at lunchtime. Thank you, Lord, for this meal. And I'm only going to focus on this meal. Thank you for it. And then you add another provision and care that you need and others that you love and care for, you pray for that. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Sometimes we use trespasses and trespass, those who trespass against us. I kind of like the newer use of the, the, the passage here in, in worship settings I've been in, in that uh, the words, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. It gets straight and direct to the point. Sometimes we stumble over this idea of debts, trespasses. Uh, I, you know, that's just a pat thing, okay? Uh, but uh, I usually use debts and debtors. That's who I, who I grew up, my tradition of taught and things like that. But again, Lord, forgive my sins. Does your prayer have that in it? And Lord, help me to forgive those who've sinned against me. Does your prayer contain that? And lead us, not, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, praying for protection. Lord, I don't want to be out of your will. I want to be in your will. I want to live a holy life that you have for me. Show me it. Protect me. A prayer that I often use, Lori and I try to pray every morning or sometime during the day if we miss the morning. And my prayer can be predictable, and I don't think it's babbling, but it's, it's a, uh, my heart is, Lord, protect my family. And probably you pray for the, your family too, for protection. I pray from, Lord, protect my family. Right now we're in this pandemic. Protect us, even though all five of us have had COVID. But I hear you can get it again, you know, because there's new strains come out, whatever. Don't get scared, okay, by that comment. Pat's not a medical doctor. But uh, I pray for my family's protection during the pandemic. But I pray then, Lord, protect us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Lord, protect us from the world and its influences and that is contrary to your kingdom. Protect us that we would not give in to their temptations. Lord, Protect me from myself. As I live in this, the flesh, I have a sinful nature. I am tempted. Uh, there are sins that are more tempting to me than other people. Lord, protect me from 
that temptation and evil that is out there. And from the devil, Lord, protect us from Satan, his demons, the influences that there of evil, that we will not walk away. My family would not turn from Christ and his way for them today. That's simply the way I pray for that protection. Again, following the pattern of prayer. Again, use the Lord's Prayer, but let it be a pattern for you in your prayers as you seek God. Again, your purpose in prayer, you're seeking God and you're worshiping Him through those prayers. I want to close, and I, I found this quote in my study this week, again from Warren Wearsby. Uh, and um, if you need a copy of this prayer, if you think it's, uh, not prayer, but uh, his comments, uh, you can call the office and we'll get you a copy of it. But um, um, I thought it was special. It's not, of course, inspired like scripture. But he says, we must never pray anything that we do not mean from the heart. Otherwise, our prayers are simply empty words. There's babbling words of the uh, pagans. Our motive must be to please God alone. Remember the heresies, I mean the uh, hypocrites? Our motive must be to please God alone, no matter what men may say or do. We must cultivate the heart in the secret place. It was said, it has well been said, the most important part of a Christian's life is the part that only God sees. Let that rest with you there. When reputation becomes more than character, that's the hypocrites, we have become hypocrites. I thought that was profound, summarizes our scripture for the day. It's time of Lent, a time for reflection and renewal in our commitment to following Jesus. We've taken the first pillar of this season called prayer. May your prayers be renewed and revived as you again focus on seeking God in your prayers. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the word today. Thank you for your spirit leading us in understanding it and now help us to live it out. May our hearts be humble before you. May we not be concerned about what others see and think about us as we pray. And when we come into that secret place, that room that is rich, that location that is rich with your presence, Lord, may we just pour out our life before you. But Lord, help us to remember to stop and listen. To look and see what you may be revealing from the word or events that are happening or things that are not happening. Help us to take the prayer of Jesus and use it as a pattern for our prayers, Lord. And that we would just follow your ways. And this is a way of prayer we were taught today. Touch each person here, Lord, that they would feel more and more comfortable with praying. That uh, they could truly be humble before you because you know everything already. Now it's time for us to acknowledge it and humbly ask for your grace and your mercy and your power and truth for living. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals. We're going to respond in worship and uh, with the Lord's Prayer. Now, that we haven't done that often. Maybe this will be the first for us. 426 the Lord's Prayer. A lot of times in worship you hear it as a solo, but there's no solos today.
we're all together to sing it, okay? And uh, I'm going to ask Don to play through first so you can kind of get the tempo of how it's done. First service was wonderful. I expect that you'll do wonderful too. Again, it's before the Lord, offering to Him. That's all who we need to become focused about. Let's think about praying this prayer and song. stand and let's sing together. Amen. May the Lord bless you with his grace, with his mercy, his power and truth. May your hearts be ready and humble to meet him in prayer. Amen.